Welcome to Bite at a Time Books Behind the Story, where we answer the questions you have about your favorite classic authors. What inspired your favorite author to write their novels? What was going on in the world at the time? Follow along with us as we tell you what was happening in the world while your favorite authors wrote your favorite classics. My name is Bree Carlisle, and I love to read and wanted to share my passion with listeners like you. If you want to know what's coming next and vote on upcoming books, sign up for our newsletter at biteatatimebooks.com. Be sure to follow my show on your favorite podcast platform so you get all the new episodes. You can find most of our links in the show notes, but also our website, biteatatimebooks.com, includes all of the links for our show, including to our Patreon to support the show and YouTube, where we have special behind the narration of the episodes. We're part of the Bite at a Time Books Productions Network. If you'd also like to hear a book by the author, check out the Bite at a Time Books podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. Today we'll be talking about the writings of Mark Twain. Overview Twain began his career writing light humorous verse, but he became a chronicler of the vanities, hypocrisies, and murderous acts of mankind. At mid-career, he combined rich humor, sturdy narrative, and social criticism in Huckleberry Finn. He was a master of rendering colloquial speech and helped to create and popularize a distinctive American literature built on American themes and language. Many of his works have been suppressed at times for various reasons. The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn has been repeatedly restricted in American high schools, not least for its frequent use of a slur commonly used for black people in the 19th century. A complete bibliography of Twain's works is nearly impossible to compile because of the vast number of pieces he wrote, often in obscure newspapers, and his use of several different pen names. Additionally, a large portion of his speeches and lectures have been lost or were not recorded. Thus, the compilation of Twain's works is an ongoing process— Researchers rediscovered published material as recently as 1995 and 2015. Early Journalism and Travelogues Twain was writing for the Virginia City newspaper The Territorial Enterprise in 1863 when he met lawyer Tom Fitch, editor of the competing newspaper Virginia Daily Union and known as the silver-tongued orator of the Pacific. He credited Fitch with giving him his first really profitable lesson in writing— When I first began to lecture and in my earlier writings, Twain later commented, my sole idea was to make comic capital out of everything I saw and heard. In 1866, he presented his lecture on the Sandwich Islands to a crowd in Washoe City, Nevada. Afterwards, Fitch told him, Clemens, your lecture was magnificent. It was eloquent, moving, sincere. Never in my entire life have I listened to such a magnificent piece of descriptive narration but you committed one unpardonable sin, the unpardonable sin. It is a sin you must never commit again. You closed a most eloquent description by which you had keyed your audience up to pinch the intense interest with a piece of atrocious anticlimax which nullified all the really fine effect you had produced. It was in these days that Twain became a writer of the Sagebrush School. He was known later as its most famous member. His first important work was The Celebrated Jumping Frog of Calaveras County, published in the New York Saturday Press on November 18, 1865. After a burst of popularity, the Sacramento Union commissioned him to write letters about his travel experiences. The first journey that he took for this job was to write the steamer Ajax on its maiden voyage to the Sandwich Islands, Hawaii. All the while, he was writing letters to the newspaper that were meant for publishing, chronicling his experiences with humor— These letters proved to be the genesis to his work with the San Francisco Alta California newspaper, which designated him as a traveling correspondent for a trip from San Francisco to New York City via the Panama Isthmus. On June 8, 1867, he set sail on the pleasure cruiser Quaker City for five months, and this trip resulted in The Innocents Abroad, or The New Pilgrim's Progress. In 1872, he published his second piece of travel literature, Roughing It, as an account of his journey from Missouri to Nevada, his subsequent life in the American West, and his visit to Hawaii. The book lampoons American and Western society in the same way that Innocence critiqued the various countries of Europe and the Middle East. His next work was The Gilded Age, A Tale of Today, his first attempt at writing a novel. 
The book, written with his neighbor Charles Dudley Warner, is also his only collaboration. Twain's next work drew on his experiences on the Mississippi River. Old Times on the Mississippi was a series of sketches published in the Atlantic Monthly in 1875, featuring his disillusionment with Romanticism. Old Times eventually became the starting point for life on the Mississippi. Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn Twain's next major publication was The Adventures of Tom Sawyer, which draws on his youth in Hannibal. Tom Sawyer was modeled on Twain as a child, with traces of schoolmates John Briggs and Will Bowen. The book also introduces Huckleberry Finn in a supporting role, based on Twain's boyhood friend Tom Blinkenship. The Prince and the Pauper was not as well received, despite a storyline that is common in film and literature today. The book tells the story of two boys born on the same day, who are physically identical, acting as a social commentary as the prince and pauper switch places. Twain had started Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, which he consistently had problems completing, and had completed his travel book, A Tramp Abroad, which describes his travels through Central and Southern Europe. Twain's next major published work was The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, which confirmed him as a noteworthy American writer. Some have called it the first great American novel, and the book has become required reading in many schools throughout the United States. Huckleberry Finn was an offshoot from Tom Sawyer and had a more serious tone than its predecessor. 400 manuscript pages were written in mid-1876, right after the publication of Tom Sawyer. The last fifth of Huckleberry Finn is subject to much controversy. Some say that Twain experienced a failure of nerve, as critic Leo Marx puts it, Ernest Hemingway once said of Huckleberry Finn, If you read it, you must stop where Jim is stolen from the boys. That is the real end. The rest is just cheating. Hemingway also wrote in the same essay, All modern American literature comes from one book by Mark Twain called Huckleberry Finn. Near the completion of Huckleberry Finn, Twain wrote Life on the Mississippi, which is said to have heavily influenced the novel. The travel work recounts Twain's memories and new experiences after a 22-year absence from the Mississippi River. In it, he also explains that Mark Twain was the call made when the boat was in safe water, indicating a depth of two, or Twain, fathoms, 12 feet or 3.7 meters. The McDowell's Cave, now known as Mark Twain Cave in Hannibal, Missouri, and frequently mentioned in Twain's book The Adventures of Tom Sawyer, has Sam Clemens. Twain's real name engraved on the wall by Twain himself. Later writing. Twain produced President Ulysses S. Grant's memoirs through his fledgling publishing house, Charles L. Webster and Company, which he co-owned with Charles L. Webster, his nephew by marriage. At this time, he also wrote The Private History of a Campaign That Failed for the Century Magazine. This piece detailed his two-week stint in a Confederate militia during the Civil War, he next focused on A Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court, written with the same historical fiction style as The Prince and the Pauper. A Connecticut Yankee showed the absurdities of political and social norms by setting them in the court of King Arthur. The book was started in December 1885, then shelved a few months later until the summer of 1887, and eventually finished in the spring of 1889. His next large-scale work was Puddinhead Wilson, which he wrote rapidly as he was desperately trying to stave off bankruptcy. From November 12th to December 14th, 1893, Twain wrote 60,000 words for the novel. Critics have pointed to this rushed completion as the cause of the novel's rough organization and constant disruption of the plot. This novel also contains the tale of two boys born on the same day who switch positions in life, like The Prince and the Pauper. It was first published serially in Century Magazine, and when it was finally published in book form, Puddinhead Wilson appeared as the main title. However, the subtitles make the entire title read, The Tragedy of Puddinhead Wilson and the Comedy of the Extraordinary Twins. Twain's next adventure was a work of straight fiction that he called Personal Recollections of Joan of Arc and dedicated to his wife. He had long said that this was the work that he was most proud of, despite the criticism that he received for it. The book had been a dream of his since childhood, and he claimed that he had found a manuscript detailing the life of Joan of Arc when he was an adolescent. This was another piece that he was convinced would save his publishing company. His financial advisor, Henry Huddleston Rogers, quashed that idea and got Twain out of that business altogether. 
but the book was published nonetheless. To pay the bills and keep his business projects afloat, Twain had begun to write articles and commentary furiously, with diminishing returns. But it was not enough. He filed for bankruptcy in 1894. During this time of dire financial straits, he published several literary reviews in newspapers to help make ends meet. He famously derided James Fenmore Cooper in his article detailing Cooper's literary offenses. He became an extremely outspoken critic of other authors and other critics. He suggested that before praising Cooper's work, Thomas Lounsbury, Brander Matthews, and Wilkie Collins ought to have read some of it. George Eliot, Jane Austen, and Robert Louis Stevenson also fell under Twain's attack during this time period, beginning around 1890 and continuing until his death. He outlines what he considers to be quality writing in several letters and essays, in addition to providing a source for the tooth and claw style of literary criticism. He places emphasis on concision, utility of word choice, and realism. He complains, for example, that Cooper's Deerslayer purports to be realistic, but has several shortcomings. Ironically, several of his own works were later criticized for lack of continuity. Articles of Huckleberry Finn and organization Puddinhead Wilson. Twain's wife died in 1904 while the couple were staying at the Villa di Cordo in Florence. After some time had passed, he published some works that his wife, his de facto editor and censor through her married life, had looked down upon. The Mysterious Stranger is perhaps the best known, depicting various visits of Satan to Earth. This particular work was not published in Twain's lifetime. His manuscripts included three versions, written between 1897 and 1905, the so-called Hannibal, Esseldorf, and print shop versions. The resulting confusion led to extensive publication of a jumbled version, and only recently have the original versions become available as Twain wrote them. Twain's last work was his autobiography, which he dictated and thought would be most entertaining if he went off on whims and tangents in non-chronological order. Some archivists and compilers have rearranged the biography into more conventional form, thereby eliminating some of Twain's humor and the flow of the book. The first volume of the autobiography, over 736 pages, was published by the University of California in November 2010, 100 years after his death as Twain wished. It soon became an unexpected bestseller, making Twain one of a very few authors publishing new best-selling volumes in the 19th, 20th, and 21st centuries. Censorship Twain's works have been subjected to censorship efforts. According to Stewart, 2013, leading these banning campaigns generally were religious organizations or individuals in positions of influence, not so much working librarians who had been instilled with that American library spirit, which honored intellectual freedom, within bounds, of course. In 1905, the Brooklyn Public Library banned both The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn and The Adventures of Tom Sawyer from the Children's Department because of their language. Publishers Mark Twain lived for two decades in a house in Hartford, Connecticut, 1871 to 1891, and the American publishing company in that city published the first edition of several of his books. The same can be said about a number of New York-based companies, such as Harper & Brothers and his nephews, Charles L. Webster & Company. Other memorable editions were created by the Ash Ranch Press of San Diego and Barry Moser's Penny Royal Press. Thank you for joining Bite at a Time Books behind the story today. While we answered some of the questions you have about one of your favorite classic authors, Again, my name is Bree Carlisle, and I hope you come back next time when we'll answer more questions about one of your favorite classic authors. Don't forget to sign up for our newsletter at biteatatimebooks.com. Check out the show notes or our website, biteatatimebooks.com, for the links for our show.